Welcome back to the second installment of the Bones series. This might be the shortest video out of all the books since it's pretty short and not as serious as the following comics. Why is that, you might ask? F fucking read the title, dipshit. It's Cow Racing, the pastime of the valley. If you haven't watched the first one, that might be important, so click the link in the description so you're all caught up. Or don't, whatever you want to do. I'll try and talk about the first two as a whole at the end anyways and how they fit into the grand scheme of the series without spoiling too much. But I'm still going to tell you how Grandma Ben's the Bill Russell of cow racing. Starting out at the spring fair, Thorn and Phonebone are walking around when there's an altercation right off the bat with a honey salesman named Tom, and this rubbed me the wrong way, so let me break it down for you. Tom hits on Thorn fairly aggressively and is a dick to Phonebone for no reason in particular, saying he's got a big nose, he's a cupid doll, a runt, and he should go back to the freak show. Pretty nasty. Phonebone defends himself by saying stealing honey from sleeping bees isn't that hard and saying he's a carny who brags about climbing trees. Then, added to the bone buff list, the BBL for short. Thorne finally says, you can't talk to my friend that way, and drags Phonebone away, yelling at him for embarrassing her and decides to walk around the fair alone. Now, it's undeniable that Tom started it, just made fun of him for being around Thorne, and Phonebone didn't even react to that. But Tom talked shit to him out of nowhere again, then got a reaction out of Phonebone, and it all just kind of devolved from there into an embarrassing situation. Thorne, when Tom is being an obvious dickhead to Phonebone, says she'll take two combs, you know, trying to de-escalate. But Tom doubles down and calls Phonebone a cupid doll, and Phonebone starts talking back. And at this point, Thorne, after two unprompted shots from Tom with no retaliation from Phonebone, did not, in fact, decide, yeah, this Tom guy's fucking dick. I don't think it's fair to get mad at Phonebone for clapping back after two shots out of fucking left field. Instead, Thorne was mad at Phonebone for embarrassing her in front of Tom and people off screen, I'm guessing. Which, yeah, you could say it was embarrassing for yourself, but you can also say, yeah, that was embarrassing for that redneck piece of shit Tom since he fumbled the bag, got showed up by this little fucking goober, and didn't sell any of the honey he climbed up that tree for. Not a social psychologist, but here, I'm team Phonebone. Anyway, Phonebone breaks the fourth wall here. Again, the only time this happens. Climbs a tree, finds some honey, and is confronted by this guy whose name I can only assume is Old Smokey or Big Bumbler or some other corny shit like that. Smiley and Phony are in the middle of work at the Barrel Haven. Phony's working as chef and Smiley the fast-talking, fear-mongering bartender for Phony's master plan. Phony uses the absolute stupidity and simplicity of the townsfolk to spread two rumors. Grandma Ben, the winner of the race every single year, is too old and decrepit to win this year against the second rumor, the mystery cow, which is Smiley in a cow costume, the fastest and most ferocious cow to ever live. Phony then establishes the odds of the race, Grandma Ben at 60 to 1 and the mystery cow 4 to 1, and simply hopes that Smiley's ability to spread rumors will convince everyone to not have anyone bet anything on Grandma Ben, so that when she wins like she does every year, they get to keep everything. Also, I hate this frame. I don't know why. I just hate both of their expressions. It makes me so uncomfortable. It's like they're halfway in between what they're actually supposed to be doing. It, I can't. I can't look at it. Meanwhile, Grandma Ben is out for a 15-mile jog, Jesus Christ, and learns of the rumors being spread about her being too old to win the race anymore, and she gets all wah wah. We then find out Foam Bone scrapped for a honeycomb bigger than a box of honeycomb and gets depressed when he sees Thorn sitting with Tom. Do not, under any circumstances, think that this influenced me being Team Phonebone. It didn't. At all. Phonebone finds Phony working a betting booth at the fair, taking bets for the race he's rigging, till Phonebone shows up and messes up his business by, you know, trying to show Phony why being a liar is a bad way to live. Real quick, I'm gonna go over my issues with the comedy of this series. It was sparked by this speech bubble from Phonebone. Not only is it far down on the list of funny jokes in these books, but it shows the age of the comedy. I don't think you can use the dialogue word for word if you were to someday do an animated adaptation, but that can be said for any adaptation. I still have hope. I still have hope discussing film will not get me down on it. I think the banter is good, and the dynamics between the characters is great, undoubtedly, but the comedy is just corny. I find phrases like, holy cow, jeez, and horse snobbies are hard to understand in 2024. Smith has said multiple times that Bone wasn't made for kids, and yeah, some of the content definitely shouldn't be, like dealing with trauma and all the violence and death. But the comedy throughout the series sometimes borders on things you'd hear in middle school, like if it was written for adults, I wouldn't mind Phone Bone walking up after getting his heart broken and just going, 
What the fuck are you doing, phony? Instead of this the up and up bullshit. But Smith wanted to write these comics without bad words, which sounds like something that someone writing a comic for kids would say. And that's not even including the physical comedy that is every chase scene and the Looney Tunes type of stunts and violence in the first couple books. Literally later in this book, there's the stereotype of having too many characters fight at once. So you just draw a big dust cloud with limbs and stars coming out of it. I think the intended audience truly is all ages, you know, a little murder followed by a silly quip. But the books were being sold at the Scholastic Book Fair to kids mostly while Smith insists that, hey, you see that silly chase with the rat creatures? It's for adults. Can you believe it? And that time Phonebone fainted because Thorne said she liked him? Ah, not for kids either. Those entire two pages of only sound effects after Lucius slips off the roof in this book? It's adult humor, in my opinion. Anyway, sorry about that. Back to the story at hand. That night we see an extended version of Thorne's dream from the first book. Kid Thorne is brought by people in cloaks to the Great Red Dragon into a cave with some other dragons. Then she wakes up in their room at the Barrel Haven. She wakes up Foam Bone and she reveals she used to have this dream all the time as a kid. But it started up again once she saw the map Foam Bone used to find his way into the valley. And she thinks the dream was real. And she drew that map when she was a kid because the dragons wouldn't let her leave. And she hoped someone would come and rescue her. But she admits it might just be a dream, and if it weren't for that map, she would think she lived with Grandma Ben her whole life. Phonebone wants answers, damn it, and wants to wake up with Grandma Ben and show her the map. But Thorn makes the obvious right choice and lets her sleep before the race. I kind of want to see the timeline of when Thorn wakes up Grandma Ben and she calls them morons for thinking a dream was real. Then she gets pissed that they woke her up before the race and puts another hole in the wall to throw Phonebone out of. The day of the race is here, and Grandma Ben's sad nobody bet on her, and Phony self-reports by being uncharacteristically positive about her chances, then makes the worst mistake of goading Lucius to try and bet his entire tavern. And Lucius, genius he is compared to these cronies, points out that none of them have seen the mystery cow that they've bet on, so they confront Phony and demand to see either the mystery cow or the anatomy of Phony's head. Thorne goes to the fair to see Tom again, but is shocked to see Tom walking around with another girl, so she finally sees the truth and Foambone was right, who's busy being convinced by Ted the Bug that the way to get Thorne to like him is to write a love poem, and his <clears throat> creative genius is interrupted by the two idiotic rat creatures trying to eat him again. Phony prepared for the townsfolk to want to see the mystery cow, so he had Smiley make it seem like the mystery cow is a crazy beast from just inside the shed, and they scare the guys away from it. With ten minutes left before the race, Thorne goes up to Grandma Ben and Lucius, asking where Phonebone is, and they don't know, while Smiley goes up to the starting line of the race dressed up in his very convincing cow costume, and Phony ignores Thorne on his way to catch Lucius to make the final bet before the race. And this man, knowing that the entire fair is betting on the mystery cow, knows two things for sure in his big old heart. Grandma Ben does not lose the great cow race, and Phony Bone is a manipulative, fear-mongering scammer. So, to ruin his grand scheme, bets his whole bar on Grandma Ben to win with the odds at 100 to 1, and Phony panics. He goes up to Smiley at the start line, telling him that the plan is ruined and he has to win or pay Lucius a hundred Barrelhaven taverns, but doesn't get the message across in time, so tries to climb into Smiley's costume to make sure he knows he has to win, which is much more likely with his added weight. The race starts and Smiley is somehow winning before Grandma Ben tries to grab him, but Phony pulls them off the cliff and they land in the middle of a rat creature patrol. Taking off and right after, Phonebone dashes in the middle of running for his life from these thugs, and look, it's the book cover. Nice inclusion, actually. I really like that. The rat creature patrol and the cow race collide with the dust clouds and the stars. They're only missing the birds circling their heads here. And Grandma Ben screams bloody murder at everybody in particular. As the mob approaches, everybody scatters as Grandma Ben prioritizes her record over the safety of the Bone Cousins, escapes the Matrix as the horde rushes past and then goes to kick the shit out of the bones. We skip over the part I wished I saw, which was Phony being tied to a stake and pelted with eggs by the angry mob, who realized they were scammed after the race, and fast forward to the bones, Grandma Ben and Lucius going back to the farmhouse at night. Instead of actually killing Phony, Grandma Ben and Lucius saved him by promising to pay off any debts that Phony caused, and put Phony and Smiley in their debt instead, specifically Lucius, who points out they'd be dead if it weren't for them, so they'll be working at the Barrel Haven indefinitely. The scene ends with both the Great Red Dragon and the Hooded One sharing the woods to spy on the group, one to protect them from the other. And I'm sure there's something deeper there, but to me it's just another, oh, bad, bad guys still lurking, good guys still not safe, uh-oh.
After a comic relief scene from these yokels, everybody's back at the farmhouse, and we peek behind the curtain a little bit as Grandma Ben and Lucius talk openly to each other. Grandma saying she only saved Phony because it's still unknown why the rat creatures are looking for him. She believes Phonebone, saying they all have no idea, because she trusts Thorn, who believes Phonebone, and reveals Lucius does indeed know about the dragon, and they throw around the T-word about Thorn, another unanswered question in this book. The chapter ends with Phonebone sneaking off while everyone else sleeps to write a love letter to Thorn that leaves nothing to the imagination. The options based off short, bald, and big nose are literally himself or phony. The actual story progression of the book ends there, and the final two parts are useless to the plot as a whole, but I don't necessarily think they make the story worse. The first is a poem about the possum kids running around and playing all day long and it being good to lay down and rest at the end of the day called the possum interlude. It's fine, whatever. The second is Smiley and Lucius about to repair the roof with Lucius hanging by a rope while Smiley annoys him, talking about how homesick he is and about his life back in Boneville. Lucius progressively gets more angry and murderous until he cuts the rope and slips off the roof. I really don't mind this kind of break in the action content, and the place where it's included is perfect. Right at the end of an action-packed, fast-paced part two of the first section of the series, there's a slow pause to keep the mood more safe, more innocent, more relaxed, before the serious stuff comes in during the next book. And I love it. The only thing about it is one could consider it filler content, and I kind of see that, but I think its value where it is in the story doesn't necessarily make it filler. Not only does it improve the mood, but the pace in preparation for the next book. The serious stuff ends with everybody sleeping after being chased out of town all night, and instead of ending on that note, instead we get a reminder. Hey, don't worry about all that stuff we don't know. Smiley's still just messing around and smoking cigars and having a good time. We still have so many unanswered questions, by the way. Why does the Hooded One want to capture Phony? And why do they spy on him instead of just tilling him with their scythe? Will Thorn realize Phonebone's feeling towards her? How will Phony get out of working for Lucius for the rest of his life? What is the turning, and is there more to Thorn than meets the eye? She's an Autobot. Sorry to spoil it, guys. This book is the only one so far to have the cover be somewhat close to a real frame in the book. This wasn't an out from Boneville, but I think it's a cool detail. But we're not focused on that. We're watching Lucius fucking lose his shit at Smiley, then Key Rash after falling off the roof. And I think that makes the story feel more full circle in the end, once shit gets real in the next book. And you know how I know? This is the last time we see Smiley consistently do that big smile or smoke cigars. From here on out, he's all business. So prepare yourselves, batten down the hatches, because it gets good. See you next week. Peace!